Okay, let us go ahead and get started. Aloha mai kako, mahalo for joining us today. My name is Lisa Ka'ano'i and I work for the Native Hawaiian Health Scholarship Program at Papa Ola Lokahi. And we'll go ahead and get started with housekeeping first. So just to let everyone know that this webinar will be recorded and for um, future reference, if you want to see one of our webinars and are unable to because you are maybe in clinic or have some other um, engagement, as long as you register for our webinars, you will receive the recording afterwards. And then also during this webinar, if you have any comments or questions, you can use the Q&A feature or chat, which is located in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And then also for future presentations, if this is your first time joining us, you will automatically be added to our email list to get um, the future webinars that are coming up. And then at the end of this, when you leave, there will be a um, survey that pops up. If you could complete that and share your mana'o with us, that is how we get our topics um, for our webinars is from your mana'o. Now, if you have to leave and you're unable to fill it out at the time, we will follow up with an email to give you um, a second chance at that. So, mahalo nui. And um, today, first of all, I would like to introduce Momi Cody. And she is actually going to start off our webinar um, with an oli. Aloha, mommy. Aloha. Aloha. All right now. E homa e keiki mai nuna mai e. O na me au na no au. O na me le. E homa e. E homa e. E homa e. Okay, hello, I'm Momi Lani. Um, I was raised here in Kali. Uh, um, I'm Hawaiian Black Irish. I'm a part of um, Hula Halau Kamalu Okukui um, under Kumu Malina. Um, I got started with the Halau in prison. And since my release, I've continued with the halal. Um, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, I'm pretty passionate about music and and dancing and yes, um, yeah. That's a little bit about me. <laughs> <laughs> Mahalo, mommy. That's wonderful. Um, and then now I will also introduce um, Kumu Malina Ka'ulu Kukui. Let's see here. She is, um, let's see. Oh, that was Lily Noy. <laughs> So uh, Kumu Malina Kukui um, 
has a Master of Social Work, and she retired from the Myron B. Thompson School of Social Work, University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2015, where she focused on behavioral health and cultural programming for MSW students. She currently assists the University of Hawaii's John A. Burns School of Medicine's Native Hawaiian Center of Excellence, where she develops and implements cultural immersion programs for medical students and residents. She also teaches a traditional family-based practice of Ho'oponopono to others who want to carry on the practice in the methodology of Mary Kavena Pukui, who mentored Richard and Lynette Agnilawan, who in turn graduated Kumumalina after several years of training. Kumumalina has been dancing hula all of her adult life, and her hula genealogy includes Mikey Ayu Lake, Me Kamamalu Klein and Hohai Suza, from whom she uniki. Since her retirement, she has been teaching hula at the women's jail, using her professional background in substance abuse treatment and trauma-informed care to help inmates embrace hula as a cultural tool for healing. And I, um, Kumu, you could turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Aloha. Aloha. Okay. Aloha. There's some instructions that popped up on my screen. <laughs> and I have to put on my glasses to see what it is. Okay. Thank you. Aloha mai kako. Aloha emomi. Mahalo nui for the oli. Um, I'm, I'm just so happy that Momi can join us. And thank you for inviting us. Um, to do this presentation. Um, at about 11 o'clock, um, Nicole Fernandes, who um, is a correctional um, program manager, was, will join us and talk a little bit about some of the um, cultural programming um, at the jail. So um, I am um, the eldest daughter of Thomas Ka'oai Ka'ulu Kukui from Hilo and Honolulu, and Felice Genwan Wong from Honolulu, um, whose ancestors came from Kwandong province. I was raised in Kulio'o Valley, um, where the Pu'uokono winds blew up and down the valley and cooled us as we played football in the streets. Um, I currently live in Kailua, um, and um, where I sometimes walk Kailua Beach. So the ocean is really important to me. Um, but my heart is in, in Waialua, um, in Waialua Beach, where my um, family and my um, ma'opuna are. So, um, mahalo nui. Um, in 2015, I retired, as Lisa said. And in 2016, I picked up the telephone and called Larson Medina, who is the director of um, recreation at the women's um, prison. The, and I said, I would love to um, come and teach hula. And so he and I, Vala out, we um, talked story about um, me coming on to teach hula. And I said that my passion is working with women. Um, and I was really looking to um, develop a hula as healing in the jail. And we talked and at some point he said, um, you know, we don't have a budget. And I cannot pay you. And I said, you're in luck, because I'm volunteering. And he said, come aboard. And I don't know if Larson is watching, because sometimes Larson and I do these things together also. So um, I've been developing um, a way to teach hula that's healing. Um, because you know all of our traditional practices um, are spiritually based. Um, and because they're spiritually based, they're healing. Um, so I have been very, very fortunate um, to be able to, to teach hula in the jail. And it's been healing for me also. And you know, hula is about storytelling. So hopefully I'm going to be telling some, some stories. But I have another story. Um, as part of 
um, my kuleana, as part of my responsibilities at the School of Social Work, um, I, I co-led um, the Hawaiian Learning Program. And part of what we did was place our students in um, organizations where they could practice um, doing some culture-based programming at the organization. And so we placed someone at Waiava in Cashbox, uh, the substance abuse program um, in the Waiava facility. And in meeting with the Cashbox staff, in, um, we, the student and I were talking about perhaps introducing some culture-based pieces of the substance abuse program um, for the benefit of the program. And the staff said, oh no, we can't do that. We can't have any, we don't do any cultural programming here. And I said, hmm, you know, I know that makahiki is, is something that happens here. And you've been doing, you, the um, OCCC, Department of Public Safety, has been doing makahiki under um, Kahu Kaleo Patterson for a number of years. And the staff said, oh, that's different. That's religion. You know, the, the inmates have a right to practice their religion. So makahiki is a religious practice. That's why we have makahiki in the jails. And I said, oh, I get it now. You have to, you have to allow them. That's why you have culture programming in the jail. And they said, well, if that's the way you wanna look at it. So I am going to back up and we're gonna take a look at not just cultural considerations in corrections, but legal considerations first, because that how, that's how it started. So Lisa, can you put up um, the PowerPoint, please? Yes, I can. Let's see here. So, you know, whenever we look at culture in corrections, and I'm not just talking about um, here in Hawaii, when you look at cultural um, programming, look at the, the Arizona. Um, program where the, the film um, Out of State was filmed, it was not because that particular correctional facility thought that culture was so important. What happened was they got sued. Um, and they got sued. Okay. Let's see. Hmm. So Lisa, you know what? I'm going to ask you to manage just, this, can. I just made you co-host. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see how we do this. Okay, last night I could do this. Um, nope. Okay, I can do it for you. That would be great. I'll cancel that. All right. So as I said, most correctional facilities are sued to get cultural programming um, in the facility. And when you look at um, indigenous cultures, because spirituality is embedded in all of our practices, then what has happened is that a lot of cultural programming that's not quote unquote religious gets um, gets into the cultural programming. So the next slide, please, Lisa. Okay. So what happens is that there were two federal, there were two laws and statutes that allowed for um, religious expression to be um, accessed by, by prisoners. So Prisoners and inmates are provided protections for their rights to practice their native religions, okay, religions. The federal government had said 
It shall be the policy of the United States to protect and preserve for American Indians their inherent right of freedom to believe, express, and exercise the traditional religions of the American Indian, Eskimo, Aleut, and Native Hawaiians, including but not limited to access to sites, use, and possession of sacred objects, and the freedom to worship through ceremonials and traditional rites. These practices may be denied if they present security, safety, health, or other serious concerns to the prison or fellow inmates. That's how we get culture into corrections, not because corrections have said, whoa, this is an appropriate kind of programming for many of our indigenous um, inmates or prisoners. They were sued. Next slide, please. Okay, so there are two statutes. One, a federal statute that's called the Religious Freedom Restoration um, Act. And there are state, there's a state and local, um, which is called, and I don't know why it's called this, Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Okay? And both statutes prevent the government from substantially burdening one's religious practice. So one of the things that has happened is that the correctional facility says, no, we cannot allow, fill in the blanks, no, we cannot allow smudging. No, we cannot allow um, any kind of um, sweat lodge kinds of practices. No, we cannot allow makahiki. And then what happens is the inmates sue, and for the most part, they win. So most of the spiritual accommodations are often won in the courts. You know, the Arizona um, makahiki and, and hula um, programming was actually won because of a lawsuit. So nobody says, please come in, come in. We would love to have cultural programming. Okay, next slide, please. So um, these are pictures of some um, cultural events at, at um, Halava, Makahiki. Um, Kahu Kaleo Patterson has been doing Makahiki for several years. Um, and the Makahiki, oftentimes people know it as games, you know, Hawaiian games. But there's a whole set of protocols, a whole set of spiritually based protocols that precede the games um, that are important to preserve and continue. And it was basically these protocols that Kahu brought into um, Halaba and brought into corrections. And I believe that over time it has um, expanded into some of the games. You know, for those of you who know Makahiki, there's Ulumaika, where you roll big stones through um, posts. Um, and, and, you know, when you're in a prison system, you, can, you can't bring in big stones because that's contraband, right? And, and it's kind of dangerous. So, so they have some games that they can use. And so, um, so thank you, Kahu, for being so persistent about Makahiki. Okay, next slide, please. So I may be partial, but the Women's Community Correctional Center in Kailua is different. And why is it different? When um, the previous warden, Mark Patterson, who just happens to be the brother of Kahu Kaleo Patterson, came to be the warden at um, WCCC. He looked around and he thought, you know, one of the things I want to do here is to create a pu'uhonua, a place of refuge, a place of safety. And this, most of you know, is um, 
part of the picture of the Pu'uho Nua O Ho Nao Nao on Hawaii Island. But it was, it was Warden Patterson's vision to create a healing space at WCCC. Next slide, please. Oh no. Okay. Um, let, let, <laughs> of course it didn't show up. Let me, let me read you then what Mark Patterson said. When I started work at Women's Community Correctional Center in 2006, I came to a few realizations quickly. One third of the women were on medication for psychiatric disorders. 90% of their crimes were drug related. And of those who were addicts, 75% had history of emotional, physical, or sexual trauma. Although most of the 270 women were incarcerated for minor infractions and classified as minimum security, the entire inmate population was treated like the 80 inmates who required higher security measures. I thought, these women don't need punishment. They need a place to heal. Inspired by the ancient Hawaiian concept of pu'uhonua, a place of refuge, asylum, peace, and safety, I set out to create such a place at WCCC. Next slide, please. So thank goodness that Warden Patterson came to OCCC because what he started to do was to develop a trauma-informed care initiative at WCCC. Um, and it just so happened that there was money coming through from the Department of Health through the feds for trauma-informed programming. So Warden Patterson started a trauma-informed planning committee of which I was part of and, and um, made sure that there was collaborative funding for it. He created with the planning committee a trauma-informed training curriculum for all WCCC staff. And it was organized by a trained correctional officer. So it was internal. And, and his whole um, initiative looked at that Hawaiian concept of mind, body, spirit, place. And he kept talking about a place to live a forgiven life. Think of that. The women's prison was a place to live a forgiven life. I think that's it, right, um, Lisa? Okay. So when you look at indigenous healing, which is what um, Warden Patterson was talking about, indigenous healing is different than um, healing from a Western perspective. Indigenous healing is a spiritual process because everything that we do in our culture is foundationally spiritual, isn't it? So it's a spiritual process that includes some kind of therapeutic change from within and includes cultural renewal. So if you look at issues of trauma, if you look at cultural historical trauma, if you look at colonization issues, if you look at justice, social justice issues, when you colonize a group of indigenous people, when, you, um, when cultural suppression is one of the ways that you try to assimilate this culture, then part of healing is to embrace 
go back and embrace your culture. So it's a no brainer that indigenous healer A is spiritual, B is cultural, that promotes cultural change. And, and that's what Warden Patterson the, um, and the groups that he brought together like the Pua Foundation, um, that's what it was intended to do within um, the jail. So I'm wondering if um, Nicole is here. No? Okay, that's all right. Hi, I'm here. Yay! Um, Aloha, I'm so glad you're here. Um, what I'd like you to do is introduce yourself. And um, in, in keeping with what we were talking about, um, perhaps you can tell people what you do now since when you left the women's jail, I'm not quite sure what you do for the whole Department of Public Safety. And maybe you can describe some of the cultural programming um, throughout the, the, the system, but focus then, come back to the women's jail because I want, us, I want to start focusing on the women's jail. So this is Nicole Fernandes. Go for Hi, it, Nicole. Everyone. <laughs> Aloha. So my name is Nicole. Um, I have worked for the Department of Public Safety for the last almost 13 years now. Um, and up until last April, I worked at the Women's Community Correctional Center. Um, I was there for about 10 years um, as the Offender Services Administrator. Um, so in that position, um, I was in charge of all the programming, overseeing the programming, um, aspects for the women, classification, um, everything that was not uh, security, essentially, is what it was. Um, and so currently, um, I work um, at our main office as a correctional, correctional program specialist, um, specifically in our inmate classification office, where we are facilitators of the transfers between facilities and so on. Um, and our office falls under the reentry office, um, which, you know, is tasked with reentry services for the department and working on um, that piece. So when I was at women's, um, it was really directly um, through working with our former warden Patterson. So warden Patterson at that time had really laid the groundwork and foundation for, you know, the future for WCCC as it relates to cultural programming. Um, during that time, the Hinamalka program, part of the substance abuse program within the facility um, had a cultural aspect um, and their program is actually called Kealaula um, as a result of that. Um, they, we've also had other programming such as, um, I'm trying to think, we've had so much programming. Uh, to be very honest, one of the challenges of my job when I was there was that there were so many community resources and people and volunteers that wanted to come into the facility to work with the women, that it was often a challenge to find space and time for that. Um, but it was always, you know, it was amazing to know that there are so many people out there that wanted to work and provide services and, um, you know, really connect with the women. Um, I'm trying to think we have so many things that we've done. So with um, at one time when I first started at women's, they also had actually um, Hawaiian language and a Hawaiian um, I don't know if it was really cultural class, but that was actually facilitated by one of one of the incarcerated women there at the time. So she worked with our education department in, um, you know, teaching uh, some of the women um, Hawaiian language, a little bit of Hawaiian culture. Um, and since then, we've had different programs come in. Um, one is with the Pua Foundation where they have offered um, it started off as it was called the Hawaiian Lecture Series, and it has now evolved into being the cultural healing and well being class. Um, and so that's a program that the Pua Foundation um, works on putting on for the women. 
Um, we've also had one of the highlights um, I feel for us was we have kids day um, throughout the year, not so much now because of COVID, but prior to that we had kids day. So we had about 10 to 12 kids day events a year. And these events are on the weekend. Um, they're very different than regular visits because in these events, the children are able, they're dropped off. Um, so no guardian or anything comes in with them. They're dropped off with their mothers and they kind of just have this day in our recreation field where different community organizations come in and they put on activities, games, food. So the women and their children have these four hours to kind of have this, you know, build their connection, right? It's very different than just coming in for a visit, sitting down, you can't move, you know, imagine having to do that with five, six year olds um, and so on. So, you know, it was a really great experience. One of um, our events was with the, with QLCC, this is about six or seven years ago. Um, and on the big island, QLCC Kona, the Kona unit, they were, I believe it was the Kona unit. Um, so they sponsored a, a kids day. And with that, they, um, they, they had Hawaiian food, they played um, Hawaiian games, they, you know, they had, they were able to kui kalo and all of that. So it was a very amazing experience. And they also assisted in bringing families over to participate, you know, and that's a really big thing, especially with um, the women's prison is the only prison in the state of Hawaii for women. So the women come to here um, with, you know, they have to leave their families. They don't get to stay on the island. And so it's very, it's very difficult for children and the guardians to come to the island. You know, at that time, airfare is like $200 a person. So a caregiver, a grandma taking care of four kids, you know, so it was very valuable and um, to have that experience where the organizations were able to do that. Um, and I know the Maui um, LT, they were actually, they worked with a bunch of families there as well. And their group, actually, um, the guardians there, they created a group called the Traveling Tutus. And so these were all tutus, all grandmas that were taking care of their mo'opuna while their moms, you know, are incarcerated. And they found, they kind of created this like peer support network amongst them, you know. So one of the, um, one of the, one of the tutus, you know, her daughter's been in the system for a while, in and out. And so she kind of took a lot of other tutus under her wing to guide them, you know, on what to expect and how to deal with certain things. So through these different partnerships with our um, local Hawaiian organizations, they've, you know, it's really filtered out to more than just what happens in the prison. Um, and so as time has gone on, you know, we still have our cultural healing and well-being. And then uh, Kumu Malina comes in to teach um, hula. And in 2019, December, I believe it was December of 2019, um, we actually held the first makahiki for the women. So up until then, that was never really provided to the women. Um, and unfortunately, I do think a lot of times it's because in terms of the size or scope of incarcerated individuals, females are a much smaller population. So unfortunately, a lot of times, not as much attention is paid to them in terms of programming and things like that. But through the work with um, Kahu Kaleo Patterson, he came in through our chaplain and they were able to, you know, start doing their first, uh, they had their first makahiki for the women. Um, and unfortunately, COVID this year, you know, kind of hinders all of that. But I'm hopeful that once things um, stabilize again and we can start doing things like that, that it would become a regular um, activity. Um, and one of the things I wanted to share, I don't, I don't know, I'm sure Kumu might know this, but through the halal and things like that, and um, the women, they put on their performances throughout the year, um, a few of the women at different times approached me and it was something I would have loved to work on if I had stayed but they kind of wanted to do this almost like a like a merry monarch 
but for the facility, right? You know, and I was just like, wow, yeah, that would be amazing, you know, or, you know, some type of celebration like that. So um, it's a very, it's very valuable to the women to have these type of cultural programs. Um, now going outside a little of the women, um, there are more, there are a little more cultural programming, I guess, nowadays with the men. Um, and that's just what I've seen over my time in the work um, in the department. Um, personally, I can just share for myself um, as an individual who works within the system. But, you know, I remember watching the, um, the film Out of State and during that time, I don't know if you all have seen it, heard of it, but if not, I, I highly recommend you watch it. Um, it was at the Hawaii Film Festival. And I remember watching it and the men there, they participated in um, the Hawaiian cultural program that they have up there. And, you know, I'm not sure if Kumu, you talked about that yet as I jumped on a little late about um, how that piece throughout the system comes in under religion. Um, the religious area, right? But, you know, they have such a really good program up there under that. And it kind of broke my heart a little bit. It, it, it warmed it, but it broke it. So it warmed it to see that the men, even though they were away from the land, that they were still finding the connection, you know, to Hawaii, to their culture, even though they were away thousands of miles across the sea. So in that aspect, it, it warmed me. But in another aspect, it, it saddened me to know that um, at that time, I, f I truly felt that they had more um, connection to their culture, being away from the land, than the men that were here incarcerated on the land. You know, and so, um, over the years, though, there has been a little more programming um, that's come in in different facilities. So like Kumu um, Hina, she goes into Halava. I believe she's going, been going in there for about a year, a year and a half to provide, you know, her class. And um, the men there have really great feedback from that. Um, uh, outside of that, I'm not too sure exactly what happens in different facilities. Um, that's still something for myself personally, I'm kind of learning along the way. Um, I do know uh, Kulani at one time also had, um, they, uh, they have a lot of good community support out there. So they had some different um, local Hawaiian organizations coming up to provide services. Um, and I, I'm sorry, Kumu, if you could help me remember um, our other, one of our um, Ho'oponopono, our other Kumu, she was doing a class up there. Um, I forget what it was called though. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, where they were, you know, it was it was more about the internal. Um, oh, okay. It's, yeah, it's still Ho'oponopono. Yeah, yeah. But they were doing that up there with um, the men at Kulani. And the men up there found that really, really valuable to them as well, so. Yeah, that's kind of a quick summary. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I'm so glad you jumped in because, you know, Nicole was very busy. She came from another meeting. Fortunately, the meetings now are Zoom. So you just kind of click and you're in another meeting, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. So just as a reminder, those of you who know who Patrick Makua Kane is, he teach, he's a Kumu Hula, very innovative Kumu Hula in San Francisco. And he teaches at San Quentin. And, and he laughs about it. He says, I cannot call myself a Kumu Hula. I am their spiritual advisor. So at San Quentin, cultural programming is still within the, the laws of religious um, expression. So at Saint, um, San Quentin, there is a um, Papa Hula, there is a Hula class, but it is a um, spiritual um, activity and the Kumu Hula has to call himself a spiritual advisor. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do is hone down on Hula as healing in the, the women's jail. Um, and I try to teach Hula, um, as 
a, a possibility for healing from trauma. Um, and so part of what we do is that we, I tell stories um, and choose um, Kahiko and Mele um, that have relevance to, to the women. Um, for example, the story of Pele and Hi'iaka is a fabulous story to tell um, with the women because it's about powerful Pele who just takes whatever she wants. Um, and we talk about the role of power um, and control in the women's lives. We talk about power misused. We talk about Hi'iaka, the younger sister of Pele, and how Hi'iaka was so loyal to Pele that she would do anything to Pele. But um, when Pele gets angry at Hi'iaka, what does Pele do? She um, kills Hi'iaka's best friend and burns Hi'iaka's lehua forest. Um, and, uh, you know, what does Hi'iaka do after she, she goes to Kauai and fetches Pele's um, lover, Lohiau, and brings him back down to Pele, and Pele is, is now jealous and says, oh, they're taking too long, and I know that Hi'iaka's sleeping with my man. So that's why she kills um, Hi'iaka's best friend and burns the forest. So what does Hi'iaka do? She takes Lohiau at the top of Kilauea, and she says, hui, Pele, watch this. She makes mad, passionate love to Lohiau. Whoa, kind of a bad decision, right? Um, and what does Pele do? In different stories, she kills Hi'iaka. She kills Lohiau. Um, but look at all the family dynamics that happens in our families. And so we talk about that um, in our hula class. We dance about it when we dance about Pele. Um, and then in the awana, in the modern hulas, we, there's, hula can be so instructive. You know, it tells us how to behave. Um, it tells stories that we um, want to remember. Um, it tells the story of, of Queen Emma when she lost her four-year-old son and her and her um, ali'i um, and goes to Kauai to heal. You know, first the family sends her away to the continent. She still comes back and she's still grieving for her family. But then she goes to Kauai where Kauai people embrace her. They connect with her. She connects with them. She connects to the culture and she begins to heal. So we dance Nahala Onawe and Nahala Onawe is an upbeat song, but we tell the story, the back story. And we remember that sometimes for a lot of us, healing comes through the culture. Yeah? Um, let me see. I'm wondering, Momi, if you're with us, um, whether you can get ready to, to talk a little about your experiences in some of the cultural activities. Because one of the things um, we do every year is we have a hoike. And we have a hoike and most of it is about hula, but some of it, much of it is Tongan dancing from the Tongan inmates, um, Samoan. Um, and it's just really a wonderful event. There's also um, a music group, band. Um, and the music group, plays for our hoike um, and and momi has participated in all of that um, last year um, we did or, or the, the facility did black history month and it was an absolutely amazing evening um, of the women uh, doing a presentation on black history and momi somehow has managed managed to be part of all of that. So Momi, are you uh, ready to talk about, first of all, about your experience in hula and, right. um, and, and how it was healing for you and, and how participating in many of the cultural events was healing for you? Hiki. Uh, Hiki. Hi. So let's start with hula. So. I got interested in hula. I had only been in prison for, I wanna say about two weeks before I saw the hula class. And I turned to Matita Mahela and I said, I wanna do that. And she was like, 
okay, so we talked to Larson, and Larson is um was um he was like that driving force for me. He showed me the way, and I kind of just took on my own path from there. But anything that was related to culture, I wanted to be a part of, and I made sure to insert myself into everything. But once I got into hula, it was like I couldn't wait to do it again. We'd spend all week inside of just practicing with the tita just to go back and be like, look, I got it. And hula just was that, it didn't make, it made it not so bad. Because when I first got there, it was my first time in being incarcerated. And at first it was just like a very depressing moment. A hula was like my escape. I guess you could say it was like an escape from that that life mm. and it just I I started to like awaken something inside of me. You know, it it brought me that's where I found joy was when I was in Hula and so I used Hula as my way of telling myself, oh this is just, you know, this is just temporary. This whole stay is just temporary. And for now, here's where I belong. And from hula, it we got to do hoike. Hoike was just fabulous. I got to learn more. Then I learned about Tongan and Samoan. I got into Samoan dance and learned something about another culture. And so, like I said, anything culturally, I wa I wanted to be a part of. And so I jumped into all of that, all the classes that um, Nicole mentioned. I took I took all those classes, cultural healing. Um, she she missed DVAC. DVAC is also a culturally based class where we made tapa and we we would pound kalo, and all of it was connected to. Um, it's actually a domestic violence class, but it was a it was culturally based. Holy Kaika is what it was called. So I was a part of that. Um, see, Ban, we had Pastor John, and Pastor John connected everything to being Hawaiian and being Hawaiian to the Bible. So we learned a lot about um, the Kalo plant. He loved the story of the Kalo plant, so he he would tell that quite often. And see where else. Um, black history is some. So I'm Hawaiian, Black Irish, and when we did Black History, I learned things I had never known. I had never known before, and I've been black all my life and didn't know these things. <laughs> and so when we did Black History, it was like very informational. That's what I noticed. All the classes. So even though like I'm I'm Hawaiian. I was raised around my Hawaiian family. There were still things that I didn't know that I learned along the way while I was in prison. And part of the reason I stayed so long is because I'd rather be in the culture classes than doing what I should have been doing to get out quicker, which I, and I don't regret, not one bit. So, yeah. Um, our Samoan dance, and I'm not Samoan, but my baby brother is. So when we got into, um, we were about to do Hoike again before COVID hit, we made a huge part on Samoan culture and we participated in that. We kind of all came together and choreographed this Samoan piece. And we learned so much from each other and from like the research we had done in order to do the dances about Samoan culture, like, oh, you know, you don't have to, I also feel like you don't have to be from that culture to take pride or have respect for that culture. You kind of just, just, I don't know, just have to have a little bit of heart and want to know, and you learn a lot, so, yeah. And it was um, it was really it, it um, 
an experience for me. And through all my entire stay in prison, I was there for almost four years. It was that all the programming, all the culture programming made it tolerable. <laughs> it made it, it all worthwhile. And I still I still meet with Kumu every Tuesday. So I stayed with Hula. Um, I tried to get in touch with Dita so she can, um, we could teach some of that Samoan dance stuff to the, the youth at um, Adult Friends for Youth. Because I volunteer at Adult Friends for Youth because that's kind of what I want to do. I want to work with at-risk youth. And so I kind of took some of what I learned in prison and I share it with them at our program. It's pretty cool. They think it's pretty cool too. Uh, when I talk about our whole weekend and stuff. So I want to share that with them and see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Momi. So Momi was like a sponge. Whatever experience that she could get her hands on, that's where she went. But what you can hear is that it filled her na'au. It filled her na'au and it made connections, not just connections to her culture, to other culture, to other people in the facility. It's about filling our na'au. That's how we heal. Yeah? We heal when the light goes on in our na'au and we pay attention to it. Um, I don't know how um, Hawaii News Now got wind that we had a halal in the jail, but they came and they um, interviewed. They, they, they filmed um, a class, part of the class, and they interviewed a couple of people. And, and you know, one of the things when the news people come, they ask you questions that you wish they had asked differently. Um, but Lisa, let's, let's show this. Find this will allow performing in the Very Modern Hula Festival. Their hearts will be in Hula, but as Jim and Dozer reports, these dancers are incarcerated. This is a rehearsal for Halal Hula Kamalu Okukui. It's a special Hula troupe. The dancers are prisoners at the Women's Community Correctional Center. I'm so proud of the women, and I'm so proud of sharing it. So I'm very, very happy. When Kumarula Maluna Kaulu Kukui started a weekly hula class at the jail, she insisted on a halal. In a halal, the women are disciplined. They learn uh, reciprocity, kokua aku kokua mai, and in that process, they learned connections with each other. Although they are incarcerated, the women say hula makes them feel free. It takes us away from you. You kind of forget that you're in prison. <laughs> and that's a good feeling. For years, hula was a recreational activity at the correctional center. The halal took it to another level. It was a high standard. You know, now I, I want uh, a certain kind of person. And if you're not that kind of person, you have to wait. It brings consistency into my life and most responsibility, which is a big change for me. Rehearsals often attract about 30 and half the people who perform in public because of their sentencing status. Kaula Kukui wishes more people could see them dance. I can watch them dance with understanding and then joy. I think I'm being when I'm dancing because I'm just so happy to do it. On Wednesday, the Halal will perform during this summit on violence, abuse, and trauma at the Hawaii Convention Center. To Mendoza, Hawaii News Now. Okay, yeah, remember that, Mommy? So, why a halal? Why was it important for me to have a halal? Those of you who dance in a halal understand why. Because you know? a halal means that there's discipline, there's a certain structure to a halal. So, um, our halal is in the dining room. And when the haumana come into the dining room every Thursday, they take off their slippers, they line it against the wall. 
They say hello to Kumo. We cannot hug. Uh, the, it, the, there's policies about touching and hugging, which makes sense. Um, but we fist bump. Well, we got used to it now in, in COVID, right? But we say hello to Kumu. Um, when halal time, um, when there's the hula um, class, the, the students, the alaka'i go and they get all of the um, things for halal. There's this big um, plastic bin um, and, and, and Cody is always one of the first to go get it, line it up, take the ipu heke out, put it on the pale, put it up front, put the words to the songs and the oli up on the, um, on the wall for people. So I don't have to say anything, right? It's hula time, the alaka'i do what they need to do in class. In class, if there's namu namu or grumbling, the alaka'i say, hui, be respectful of kumu, no talking, yeah? If there's a question about the footwork or the hand motions, we all know that we talk to the kumu. We ask the kumu. We don't ask the, the hamana next. How do you do that? And if somebody does, the alaka'i goes, oh, you got to ask kumu. So the rules and the discipline, right, are, are, are maintained by the alaka'i and the veteran hula dancers. So when we're performing, the rule is you make your hula sister look beautiful and somebody else will make you look beautiful. You don't pay attention to yourself. So kokua aku kokua mai, it forces people to A, be dependent on another person to help with the dressing. And it requires that as a haumana, I help you. So I got to make sure that the kaula, the string from the pa'u skirt isn't hanging below or that the back of the pa'u skirt isn't kind of folded up. There's, there's a discipline to it, yeah? One day I was walking out of class and I was walking out with another volunteer and she said, oh, what a day, what a day. I went in and I said, this is what we're going to do today. And the, the women said, we don't want to do it. We don't want to do it, we're not going to do it. And the volunteer said to me, do you have those kind of days? I said, never. She said, how come? I said, I have a halal. I have a halal and I'm the kumu. I never have those kinds of days. The haumana are so protective of me. People ask me, are you afraid to go into the prison? I go, never. Well, for one thing, you know, at the women's jail, most of the women are minimum security, right? Never. So it's important to have the discipline of the halal. That's the structure. Um, one day, Larson Medina, the director of recreation for whom this would never have happened, said to me, and it was just about six weeks into um, my stint there, he said, you know, the halal, the hula class, should not be under recreation. He said, it's not recreation. It should be under the educational department. I said, the fact that you recognize that means that you get it. Don't you dare put me under the educational department. And the other thing he said was, you know, the women need an opportunity to dance out. They need to demonstrate that they're disciplined dancers. They need to tell their stories because they, when we've danced out, we dance other people's melee, but then they tell their own stories. And he said, they need to tell their stories more often without shame to people who will listen. They need to inspire other people. See, Larson gets it. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. So we have danced out and we did the opening segment of the 2018 IVET conference, IVET, Institute on Violence, Abuse and Trauma. We did the opening, a thousand people show up. And, uh, and I, and I want to show you um, a clip 
from that. Um, they are beautifully dressed, partly because of um, community people who have, who have bought the fabric. They are beautifully dressed because my kaka'ako haumana come in and help them get dressed. The kaka'ako haumana help with the lays. The kaka'ako haumana um, trim all of the tea leaves because we can't bring scissors in and for the women to make their own adornment because when they make their own adornment, the mana of their working with the tea leaves and their own adornment is in that um, adornment and, and their allies. That it brings their spirituality to the forefront. So this is um, the opening Oli, and then they chant, um, they dance Kilauea about Pele. Lisa?
Okay, thank you. And the passion. Okay, so um, imagine dancing in front of a thousand people. Um, that um, meleho okipa, that welcoming chant, is so appropriate for them and for the event because it says the journey has been long in getting here. The journey has been long and there have been so many challenges. The rain keeps coming and keeps coming. The wind blows so strong that, you know, the how trees all mock it. And the waves just keep rolling and ro rolling and rolling. Do you know what? The sisterhood is here. Come in to our sheltering hale by the sea and we will welcome you. We will look over and protect you. So come, come and aloha. And it is so, it was so appropriate because many of the um, audience are survivors of trauma and it was challenging for them to get here. And you know what? The women, when they chanted, they own that chant. They understand the challenges. They understand the whipping winds and the rains and the rolling surf that makes it so hard for them. They own it. They own it. Um, what I forgot to say earlier is only minimum security women are allowed to dance out. So in our hoike, in our annual um, kula concert, Polynesian um, concert, of course, anybody who can will dance. But in order to dance outside of the facility, um, they have to be minimum security. And I have to give a shout out to Larson Medina again, because Larson has to accompany the women for every single dance out. He's the one who drives the van. He's the one who sits and waits and is part of, of the, um, the event. And with IVAT, he picks them up early in the morning. And you know what? They don't get out until like three or four o'clock. And then we go to the um, Ulu Poheao, close to the prison, and we present our adornment to the Ahu because we can't take it in. And then we talk more about the Heiau, which is right next door to the prison, and um, the meaning of the Heiau. Um, we actually dance um, at the at the Heiau. Um, and once again, we connect. We connect to our culture, we connect to the place, we connect to the protocols. It's all about connection and, and, and building the, the light in our na'au. Um, when we went and danced at St. John's Lutheran Church, we've done that twice, because it's pretty close to the halal. Um, the women were so touched by the reactions and the response from the congregation. So I wrote down a couple of things that the women said about their experience in dancing and telling their story to the congregation at the church. So one of the women said, when I told my story and cried, they cried with me. I didn't feel alone and they understood. Another woman said, I realized that I'm not just a prisoner with a capital P on my forehead. It's just some place I have to be right now. Being out in the community shows me how I need to develop into a fuller person. And there are people who will make room for me because I might be sitting in the pews, that same pew, someday. So, Larson was right. The women need to tell their stories in the community. They need to feel that the people who listen understand them. And make no mistake, when the women tell their stories, people listen generously. At that IVAT conference, when the women um, did a breakout session on a workshop on hula as healing, they got a standing ovation. And when they got a standing ovation, they sobbed.
So healing is possible in a correctional facility. There needs to be a vision about the healing potential of programming. Um, Momi, do you have anything final that you want to say? Take about a minute. I don't know if you do. Do you want to say any final thoughts? You summed it up very well. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Nicole, final thoughts. Um, I will say I definitely got a little emotional over here, so I'm glad you couldn't see me. <laughs> I was a little teary eye watching the women at IVAT, um, you know, and that's just because I know all of them. Um, I've seen them all on their journey. And, you know, I think Momi is a great example and I'm so proud of her. Um, but really having these different cultural programs, especially things like the Halal and when we have Ho'iki and they have all these different dances, something happens in the facility that not everybody gets to see, you know, and the women, they, there's a shift in what's going on for them. And I don't know if they can see it, but I see it. And the women that are in the Halal, they start to carry themselves differently, right? So the values that they're learning through being in the Halal filters out in other areas um, during their time there. They start to, um, you know, they tend to want to be role models, want to be leaders, want to set the example for the other women in the facility. They hold each other accountable. That is 100% true, you know, for, for we are not just a reflection of, of each other. We are a reflection of the halal. We are a reflection of kumu. There's also this sense of pride and confidence and purpose when they are working on things, especially for this big event of Ho'ike, you know, and the passion and just this confidence is, it's just emulating from the women and they just, you know, you see them light up again and they, they do, they have this sense of purpose. And one of the other things I have found with this, these programs, especially when we do big facility events like Ho'ike, it brings all the women together. And so in that time, they forget about their differences, right? I've seen people who don't get along, now they're getting along. You know, we're, we're working towards this common goal of putting on our performance, right? And exactly like Kumu said, you know, somebody's going to make me look good, I'm going to make somebody else look good. And so there's this reciprocity that's going on and and yeah it's just there's there's a change that happens within them thank you i, I want to give a shout out to um the kaka'ako halau hamana because they come in and they help they help the women dress and and not even just that but you know when you watch the women dance at ivat they, the women made their own tea leaf lays, they made their own le po'o. Um, it's the kaka'ako halau who goes and he, they, they gather the red tea leaves, the, the yellow tea leaves, the green tea leaves. They're the ones who, who, who rib and roll the tea leaves and freeze it. Tons, tons of frozen rolled tea leaves that I can bring in, bring into the halau, I mean to the prison so the women can make their own tea leaf lays. I also want to give a shout out to the correctional officers at the women's prison. Because when you do hoike, all kinds of stuff come into the facility, right? I have to write a memo of every single thing I'm going to bring in, including bobby pins and how many safety pins I'm going to bring in. And one year I said 12 safety pins, cause you know, when we're doing costuming, we pin 12 safety pins. Okay, the correctional officer counted 12 safety pins. I put it in a little tub. When I was leaving, the correctional officer went, 11 safety pins, where's your 12th one? And I went, OMG, where is my 12th safety pin? I finally found it pinned to one of the costumes. I couldn't get out of there without showing 12 safety pins. Now it's a royal hassle 
when there is a huge event like Hoike, because the correctional officers have their own kuleana about safety, about security. And I'm bringing in 15 pa'u skirts and 15 this and 15 that and blah, blah, blah. And they look at all of it. And, and that's times 25 because other people are doing the same things. So got to give a shout out to the women's facility um, correctional staff. Oh, I wanted, I, to also, say, yeah. I wanted to say one thing real quick too, as you mentioned staff. Um, you know, the staff there and throughout all our correctional facilities here in Hawaii, you know, a large amount of our staff are also um, Polynesian. And one of the things that I have personally seen through the whole Ike um, experience and the development and how it's actually grown into such a large event now, where we actually have, uh, prior to COVID outside, we have visitors that come in to, you know, it's not just for the facility, but I've seen staff, correctional officers, now become a part of Ho'ike in terms, right, Momi, right? Bring, helping to bring in um, clothing to the dress, teaching the women dances, helping provide music, helping to ensure that, okay, you know, we're going to have practice at this time and so on. So there's this really, um, there's just this really great experience and dynamic that happens through, through this type of um, cultural experience within the facility you know it kind of it, it shifts the role a little like they're they are still there to provide security and and be staff but it also allows them to kind of work on the same level for and in this cultural experience so i just wanted to share that good thank you yeah and, and i think it matters that as um the previous warden said most of the women are really minimum security type women. And so it's not like you've got all of these security issues like you do in the men's prison, where so many of them are maximum security people and so you need maximum security. Yeah, so, so there is a structural organizational difference that allows for these kinds of programming to take place. Um, so yeah, and the other shout out I wanna give is to Larson Medina, who is currently the director of of recreation for whom none of this could happen. And he keeps talking about retirement and I just get really scared <laughs> that he's gonna retire and then, oh, we have to retrain the next, the next recreation director who may have a different mana'o about things. Um, and um, I wanna give some time for question and answer, but I wanna also give a shout out to Momi. I still remember Momi, the last Hoike we did, you were everywhere. Momi was part of the MC. She danced every single hula, probably every single Samoan, every single um, Tongan, and then she was also in the band. <laughs> it was like, wow. she was exhausted at the end of Hoike, you know? And then we had people ready to dress her because we have costume changes. We have, as, as Nicole said, we have lots of people coming in, sewing costumes, bringing costumes. So we had people ready to dress Momi because she had to be dressed and out there in two minutes. Momi was not going to miss out on anything, on anything. <laughs> yeah, so my thing was to transition from Hawaiian to Samoan to Tongan and to greet the audience in that, that um, culture's language so i asked certain acos like the tongan acos Samoan acos how i say hello and good evening and someone how i say hello and good evening in tongan so that i could say it when when it came time to introduce that culture so it, it was pretty cool it was awesome I love love your spirit mommy <laughs> uh, so it is getting um close to time and we are taking questions. We have lots of positive feedback. Um, let's see, I'll take a look at some of the chat questions. Um, someone's ready to volunteer. So Kumu, how do folks get a hold of you? Um, if they want to volunteer in the jail itself, there's a volunteer coordinator. I'm looking at Nicole and you have to go through a volunteer training. If you're looking at Halau, um, 
you know what um i i can i can if, if you give me the information lisa i can contact people but there's okay. a volunteer um a whole volunteer division department that that has to um vet all volunteers right. okay so folks that are interested if you want to you can email me um, via the announcement email announcement for this presentation um, at eSpecialist um, at papaolokahi.org. So got some other comments. Wonderful. My kailoa, mahalo nui. Yes, sharing their life experience is so important for others to understand. We are all here for a purpose. We are all where we should be. Dear Melina, I love your warrior spirit, loving heart, and persistence in bringing healing to women and families through culture. Um, this is an awesome program. Oh, here's a question. Aloha to the panelists. Mahalo to you all for this very moving presentation. I've heard it said before by some Pu'ohonua practitioners and advocates that it's impossible to have a Pu'ohonua within a prison. It would appear based on all you've built together at WCCC, that might not be true. Could you share your mana'o on this idea and maybe what more lies ahead in the greater movement towards transforming our carceral system? Um, I'm, I'm going to just say a couple of sentences. I'm going to turn it over to Nicole. Um, there is a recent task force uh, report out, HCR 85, that looked at prison reform within our system. And one of the things that they recommended since there's such a high prevalence of Native Hawaiians and Polynesians in our correctional system and who are incarcerated, that more cultural programming be in within the prison and jails and as transitional programs. So there is a formal report to the legislature that is recommending that. Um, prior to Warden Patterson leaving, um, there was even a lo'i. Yeah, there was a lo'i, Nicole. I, I believe that the lo'i has now come into disrepair, but there's some talk about restoring the lo'i and finding people, um, that's what we can do, finding people who are willing to come into um, the women's prison to restore the lo'i. You know, it's a beautiful campus. It's a beautiful campus and there is a place for the lo'i. Um, and we need, we need a core group of people who want to now restore the vision of a pu'uhonua. It, it takes a, a group of people and it takes early adapters to say, I, I can do this. But Nicole, you got a response to that? Um, yes, I will just say that it definitely takes leaders um, that wanna go outside of the box. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, a lot of this, like with Warden Patterson, it wasn't done before in correctional facilities here. But, um, you know, being open and willing to explore these different avenues of doing things, because it in the past, it was never something like working on a lo'i in a prison. That was never a thought of before, right? But it's really um, about that. And, you know, that was Warden Patterson's um, vision for WCCC, and he is still continuing that vision as he is now across the street with um, the youth facility. But it is about, you know, his vision at that time, which really laid the foundation for a lot of these programs that have come in, is can prison be a place of healing? And if that's the question, then 100% I say that yes, it can be. Um, our, our justice system, it does not have to be one of punishment. Um, I look at it in the same way, um, very similar to a, po, a puhonua in that the punishment in itself was that is that, you know, you are away from your community, you know, and now you're in this area. And while you're in prison, especially at WCCC, you know, we can provide you all of these different tools and resources and experiences. And it's up to each, women, each woman there to determine what experiences she wants to participate in and so on right and then from there the women go on their healing journey and the hope is that once they are back in the community very similar to what uh, kumu shared about with one of the women shared after the um they went to the church was that they're not looked at or stigmatized as a prisoner right because at the end of the day the reality is 
95% of people that are incarcerated will be back in our community. They are our community members. They're our neighbors, our friends, our family, you know, so um, yeah, that's my, that's my thoughts on that. Can I share a big picture dream? And um, I see that my, one of my mentors about gender specific treatment um, is tuned in and that's Linda Rich who used to be the ED at um, the Family Treatment Services in Kaimuki, um, where um, the Women's Way is part of. And um, it's a program for um, pregnant and parenting women who um, are substance abusers. The, the, the kids live with the women and have daycare when the women are in treatment. One day last year, Nicole here came back from auditing um, a correctional facility and she said, guess what I learned? There's programs, there's a program where women can bring their kids into the prison system and the kids, the toddler kids stay with them. Wouldn't it be great? Because we're talking healing. We're talking about interrupting that intergenerational um, incarceration right? Wouldn't it be great if we could have something like that here at the women's prison? And I said, I know some people who can help with that because that's what women's way is, right? So Nicole's vision, Nicole's dream, which I think is fabulous, is having a prison system where toddler kids can come and live with their mothers while their mothers are incarcerated. How's that for thinking outside of the box here in Hawaii? Nicole, we got to move with that. So anybody <laughs> want to jump in on that? And we're going to say HCR 85 said, <laughs> we need to look at this differently. HCR 85 said, don't build prisons like you want to. Let's rethink the building of prisons. So, you know, when you start thinking about healing and corrections, then your thinking goes broader and broader. Let's do something about this, Nicole. <laughs> yes. With the rich. Uh -huh. Larson, when you retire, you know, when you retire, we have another job for you. You know, and, and before I left women's, um, and, and I think it's something definitely the current warden still thinks about. It's just, you know, COVID has really changed a lot of things that we can do right now. But prior to me leaving, we were actually talking about and trying to plan for um, an overnight kids day event where um, the kids and mothers would, uh, would be able to stay somewhere um, with their children. And so that would have been like our kind of first step into you know, that process and, and as we grow, we could have, we could hopefully show that, you know, it's a, these are the ideas worth investing and really putting our time and money into, so. And Linda Mahalo, I hate, to in, but, no. I hate to interrupt, just for a second, it is past time. Um, I just want to, if folks have to leave, we want to respect your time and just want to mahalo everyone for joining us. Um, because the questions and the conversation is still um, going well. We're going to go ahead and stay on if you want to stick around. Um, but we will also have um, more webinars coming up, which um, I'll mention in the recording so you can give an, get an idea of what will be coming up. So um, I don't know if you wanted to go ahead and continue on your thought, Kumo, or if you wanted to move on to another question. No, I just think we, you know, when we look at healing, it's a much broader issue when you're looking at healing and corrections. Let's think out of the box. Right. And there is a question, actually a good question. What if any facility improvements are necessary to enhance cultural programs at WCCC or even at other PSD facilities? That's not a question I can answer. <laughs> Nicole? So, um, you know, I, I, there's so many that could happen. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things, especially with WCCC, is the understanding that the, the physical buildings of WCCC was never built to be a prison. It was built for the youth um, and the women eventually, they kind of crossed many years ago and that became the women's prison. Um, so it's very old, it's very outdated. So in general, um, you know, uh, 
not to kind of go on and on about it, but one of the bigger visions at the time, um, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of it does come down to, to money, budget, finances, um, but we had talked about um, our courtyards, right? Our courtyards, Momi, Kumunos, our courtyards are so outdated and it's actually, I don't even know if we can find people to come in to repair them, but um, there was talk at one time for us, we were thinking about uh, somehow making that a grass area, right? So whatever type of grass, so that things like um, halal and other activities could take place out there. Um, and so, I know that um, the warden there now is always open to volunteers coming and assisting in any way they can. Um, one of the projects in the past was um, we had a church group um, out from the windward side. They, you know, they noticed that oh, when it uh, when it's time to check in for visits, the volunteer, the visitors are waiting outside, and there's no place for them to wait if it's raining or if it's really hot. And so they volunteered. Um, they connected with the warden and they volunteered and built um, what we call like our little arbor area now so that there's a shelter, um, you know, a covered place. So um, that's definitely something I guess we can somehow link up and I would be more than willing to forward you or link you up with the warden there now um, and connect you folks with him if, you know, those are things you're interested in. Mahalo. Another question is, how can the success stories of the women's cultural programs influence or enable similar programs for the men at PSD facilities, knowing they have higher security custody levels and security concerns? That's another Nicole question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that's a really hard one, but not really, because, you know, if you, if you look at our our saguaro population as example they have high custody levels as well um, but they're also still able to do things so it is possible right it's just under the right direction and um, and you know I think definitely continuation of of showing the success um, that the women's programs are having right and and ultimately um, in corrections recidivism drives a lot of things. So if if we can somehow figure out how we can do research to show that participation in certain programming helps reduce recidivism, then ultimately that boosts um, sending the, uh, having those type of activities. Um, I also think a lot of it is just having volunteers and people that want to come in. Um, you know, it's not always everybody's first thought like, oh, I want to go volunteer at a prison. And, and so being able to show that, you know, it's not really as bad. It's not always what you see on TV and that they are truly, you know, just like you and I, they're just, they're just in time out for right now. It's how I look at it, you know? And, and so, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of just my thoughts on that. Um, as somebody that's worked in in this field for a while now, yeah. Mahalo. And is this program on the Big Island? Or anything similar? Um, I, not that I'm aware of. All right, and Nicole Ooh. mentioned, off the Big Island. Right. <laughs> um, Nicole mentioned an abundance of community support available, yet a lack of space and time to accommodate. What changes are necessary to allow the overabundant supply to meet the demand? Hmm. That is a great question. And that is one that I have never really found the answer to. Um, you know, outside of building things, which it, you know, that, that's a little harder. And then there's not enough time in the day. And that's the biggest one, right? There's, there's not enough time in the day. There's so many different programs and activities that um, are coming in that are required that are not. And so um, really, I think it, it would ultimately just have to be some form of an overall assessment of programming and, you know, seeing what programs um, does the department want, but also what do the women want? What do the women feel? So outside of what's required, what are the different 
um, enrichment activities, you know, education stuff. Um, to me, that, that's what's important as well, is knowing what, what do they want, what do they need, not just us telling them what they should do and what they need. Mahalo. Um, speaking of funding, what should be needed to support and sustain similar programs for the long term that span pre and post release cultural programming? If there isn't a volunteer champion like Kumu Malina. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of volunteer champions and warriors in there the prisons. Mm -hmm. oh yeah, you know, and, and exactly what Kumu said, there, there are a lot, a lot of what happens at WCCC um, truly could not happen without our volunteers. Um, it, it's, you know, to have that, I always tell people that, you know, like, for example, when they were talking about, you know, the building of this uh, new OCCC, and um, they had to come to the Kailua community board as well, because they were gonna, they're gonna make some changes to the women's prison. Uh, the Kailua area, the Windward area, actually was not opposed to the changes at the facility. And, and we actually have a community that welcomes and embraces us, right? Uh, many other community areas are not in my backyard and, you know, because of the thoughts and perceptions and st stigmatism that goes with a prison and a jail. But the Windward community has truly embraced the women and and what what we're trying to accomplish at WCCC and so um, yeah that was what I wanted to say with Kumu regarding the funding uh, I'm not yeah. sure it's, it's a, that's like a whole another webinar on that right that totally <laughs> we, you might we have to take schedule a another one we take the um, task force report recommendations of HCR 85 and we wave it in front of the uh, legislative bodies and we um, ask for money. And we go to OHA mm -hmm. and we say we need to support these kinds of things because OHA um, has also put out reports on the prevalence of um, Hawaiians in, in the criminal justice system. So we get all of our allies together and we, we organize and we go to the yeah. legislature and say, this report and this report and this report says such and such. Here's what we, we would like to do about yeah. that. Yeah, I definitely, I, I agree. You know, it's just kind of continuing to have the voice and to bring awareness and education to, to it. And the more we do that, then I think other things will fall into place. And, and, you know, there's a mental health slogan that says nothing about us without us. So we need to have people like Momi and other people who have been um, part of the prison system who have some understanding about what is needed and what they need and what makes their na'au sing to be part of that also sitting at the legislature saying, let me tell you my story. Okay, mahalo. We'll take one more question. Um, so... Is anyone currently conducting research that you mentioned whether participation in cultural programs reduces recidivism? Does the reentry office or any office have a list of cultural programs currently being run? You know, I can't answer that directly, but I would go see Terry Bisson from the Pu'a Foundation, um, who is who, who has been just with Patterson um, from the beginning and who helped with this. And in fact, they both wrote a paper. So if you Google them, um, you can find the, the, the prison as a healing place article. Um, and my guess is that she has been part of some research or has been talking about doing some research um, about this. Uh, you might also wanna take a look at what Kat Brady has been doing for the last 20 to 30 years on uh, criminal justice system issues. I'm, I know that they're out there. Mahalo. And for any other questions you may have, um, Zoom does uh, keep the questions in chat and we'll save it to our file and we'll pull those out and email the um, answers to your questions. But I just wanna really a huge, huge mahalo to Kuma Malina and Momi for joining us. And Nicole was a surprise right at the last minute yesterday. I found out she was joining and so that's, 
amazing, especially because all these questions were geared towards you. <laughs> so mahalo, mahalo for join, joining us today. And, and thank you for all the um, everyone else that took time out of their busy day to visit our presentation. I just want to give a big mahalo to Kim Kuule Bernie and Marvin Buenafe, who are my support during these webinars. And then also um, that one of the other webinars that are coming up on the Papa Ula Lokahi side right now is the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander 3R committee that is giving a report to the community. And um, it's their last one of the series of January through February. And then also um, we have, I think there's one coming up in March actually that Lilinoi Kawahikawa is going to be hosting, I believe. It's gonna be in the beginning of March, which actually does have to do with um, data sovereignty uh, called About Us, For Us, and By Us. So those are ones that will be posted by Papa Olokai. So keep an eye out for information on their Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter. And then for uh, Native Hawaiian Health Scholarship Program, the one I'm gonna be doing next is actually on February 26th. And that's going to be um, featuring Dr. Aukahi Austin Seabury. And she's going to be talking about, um, she's the executive director for Iola Lahui. And she's going to be talking about provider or caregiver burnout, which um, I think is probably going to be helpful for a lot of us as this pandemic continues. So once again, don't forget to complete the evaluation if can. And cannot, there'll be an email out next week. And this is truly where we get our ideas for future topics. So just want to tell everyone to enjoy your weekend, 3D weekend, and um, we'll keep in touch. So ahui ho. Thank ahui ho. you. Thank Thanks, you. Mommy. Thanks, Nicole and Lisa. Thank yeah. you so much.